Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 12, and we are going to start in verse 31 and read through verse 37 this morning. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is not known, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Praise the Lord. Great to be together and to be in God's Word. Hallelujah. Well, so we're in Matthew and we're looking here at Jesus and uh, the work that uh, he's doing here amongst his people, Israel, which he's still working amongst today uh, by his grace and his mercy. I'm so excited about the story of, of the gospel and how it unfolds because. Um, What's happening in Israel today, as you know, is super relevant. Uh, God said that in the last days, he would pour out his spirit of grace and supplication upon his people Israel. And he's drawing them back in spite of their unbelief. There's a lot of unbelief in Israel, but God's plan is to bring them back. And it's his kindness that brings us to repentance. And if while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more, while they are yet sinners, will he woo them back to himself and reveal his death and resurrection to them as well? And that is the fullness of the gospel found in Romans. <clears throat> as Romans 11 caps it off with, uh, so all Israel will be saved. God's plan is not to cast them off forever, but for a time, while he can... Uh, works in the church age and saves Jews and Gentiles alike. And then in the last days, it's going to be all about the Jews. But there will be many Gentiles who will be saved in the tribulation as well. We see that in the book of Revelation. And what a blessing it is to see God's plan unfolding. So Father, as we jump into your word right now, Lord, and we pick up with your story and your first coming and recognize that your story continues and we'll continue forever, and we get to continue forever with you, and we become forever friends as we grow together in your grace and in your love and all that you have for us. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us now through your word, that you would strengthen our lives and our hearts on the things that you have for us to hear today, that your word would not return void, but it would accomplish what you please. Be with Israel in their... um, war that they're in right now. We know, uh, Lord, only you know how big it's going to go in the immediate. We know ultimately it's going to go worldwide. But Lord, today it's a local war, but it's important. It's, it's big. And I just pray, Father, that you would guard and protect them and keep them and that you would reveal yourself more and more to them, Lord, in your love and in your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your gospel. We pray you would permeate our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so the uh, scribes and Pharisees, these are the religious leaders of Israel, and it's amazing how uh, it feels like time for Israel has stood still, because Israel is still very much in the, the very same position. They know about Jesus, and they don't accept him as a nation. And then it was this growing um, conflict between the religious leaders and Jesus. And the religious leaders of Jerusalem came down And that's the way they would say it, even though they went north. They came down from Mount Zion, and uh, they uh, spoke with Jesus. And uh, 
in their conversation with the people before Jesus addresses them, they are accusing Jesus of doing what he does by the power of Satan. And so Jesus calls them to himself there in the house, Mark tells us, and he begins to talk to them and those who are there about how unreasonable that is, how that makes no sense whatsoever. That is denying reality. And that is a, uh, a movement that's become very popular in our culture today, deny reality. <laughs> Just deny it. Like, yeah, science, what's that? That doesn't matter. Let's, let's try uh, something more emotional. And let's go with our emotions and just uh, throw science out the door. And, um, and so, uh, two, they're being unreasonable in their conclusions. And so Jesus has addressed them and said, look, Satan's kingdom stands. You know that it stands because you see his effects in the world. You see the sin. You see people's rebellious hearts and lost souls. You see people bound up in addiction. You see people bound up in demon possession and oppression. You see uh, there's a, there is a concerted, like organized, effective work that Satan is doing. So if Satan were divided against himself and casting out Satan, if Satan were casting out Satan, his kingdom would not stand. It wouldn't stand, there would be no, it, it wouldn't exist. And so your reasoning that Satan's kingdom is divided is a foolish reasoning. He is a formidable foe. He's greater than uh, humanity. Humanity cannot handle Satan. No way. Satan will control the world for a very short time. And he's working at doing it right now. But he's not greater than God. As much as Satan is greater than us, is not even comparable to how greater God is to him. God created him. God can shut him down in a nanosecond. And he's going to. He's going to burn up from the inside out. That's what we read prophetically. And the world, the kings of the earth, are going to watch him burn to a pile of ash. And they're going to marvel that that was the one who controlled the nations. I mean, think about that, that statement right there. That was the one who controlled the nations. That's a big statement. That's a powerful being, and yet nothing in the hands of God. And so Jesus has reasoned with them on this level, and then he's warned them, look, you need to watch out. Because what, in reality, what you are doing is you are denying the presence of God. That if I do what I do by the power of God, or like Luke says it, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You're like standing in the middle of the kingdom of God and you're accusing God's kingdom as satanic. That is pure evil. And so he warns them about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has gone out as a witness to the world and is convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And for them to deny the work of the Spirit in the life of Jesus was to deny God. And you think about it this way. John the Baptist came preaching as a powerful prophet of God and forerunner of Jesus Christ, and the scribes and Pharisees denied and rejected his ministry. And it was an Old Testament ministry, one of the law and repentance, and they denied it. They denied God, the Father. Then God the Son stood in their presence, and they denied the Son. And now the son is saying, you be careful. You deny the Holy Spirit and you've got nothing left. You are hell bound. And you are just going to be burning in hell forever. It will not be forgiven in this life or in the next, in the one to come, the age to come. And so that's where we left off with that warning. But he's not done with them yet in speaking about this reasoning. And he says this, he, they're an agriculture society, and he says, 
Either make the tree good or its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. And so our words matter is the title of the message. Our words matter. And you're going to see how he brings this down to their words. Because what are they doing? They're committing the, one of the worst sins possible through their words. They say that the Holy Spirit's work is of the devil and is the devil's work. And that Jesus is really drawing power from Satan rather than the Holy Spirit. And we are told specifically and clearly in Scripture that Jesus did all that he did through the Spirit. And he obeyed the Father in his every word and his every command. And so as we zero in on this parable that Jesus gives, this a comparison, a tree is known by its fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. A good tree has good fruit. That's how you know it. A bad tree has bad fruit. You cannot call a life with good fruit bad. And you can't call a life with bad fruit good. And this is something that we as humans in our fallen state do. Oh, no, 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 you misunderstand them. They're a good person. They really are. You just got to get to know them. Yeah, right now they're stabbing me in the back. It's, it's, it's hurting really bad, but oh, you just got to get to know them. Yeah, I just got to submit to them. I just got to get under their authority and they'll be okay with me until they're not. The, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we have to watch out for this attitude. Look at what Jesus says earlier in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a, a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So, you know, people say, you don't know my heart. You can't judge my heart. Well, your own words do. You speak, we hear, we judge. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what we're about to read. And so... The Lord is reasoning here, and, and watch out for that generation, and watch out for those. In Isaiah 5.20, woe to those, woe to those, and that's a word of judgment. Whenever you see the word woe, it's not a good word. And uh, if you've ever experienced the chastening of the Lord in this life, wow, he can really chasten, can't he? Can you imagine eternal judgment? It's at a level that is in, uncomprehendable to mankind. As much as we cannot comprehend the glories of heaven, and we only have these little tastes of heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Corinthians tells us, we cannot comprehend the devastation of hell. And to lighten it, to try to make it less than what the Bible says it is, is foolishness. It's just a very strong warning to not go there and to make sure that we receive Christ and his grace and his mercy, to not be lifted up with pride and take a gamble on our own salvation with our own righteousness. That's foolishness. And so the Lord says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He gives this open invitation to those who are trying to make it to heaven on their own. And he says, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, the glories and the beauty and the majesty of heaven. Oh, how sweet it is. How glorious it is. How sweet it is to know that our sins are forgiven, that we've been washed and we've been cleansed, and that we have no longer have the fear of judgment death and hell in front of us. Only death, which the Lord compare, uh, compares to sleeping. It's like we've been practicing every day. <laughs> Most days on how to die. Just let go. <laughs> Some days it's really hard. Last night, oh man, I think I just had too many stressful thoughts. I could not sleep last night. And those nights are miserable. I love the nights where you just slip right into that slumber and it's just so peaceful. 
and you wake up in the morning, it's going to be faster than that. It's going to be easier than sleep because you're just going to relax and wait a minute, what just happened? <laughs> that was easy. What was I dreading? I can't wait to get that in the rear view mirror. It's going to be behind us soon. John 5, 36, but I have a greater witness than John, Jesus says. So John has testified that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But he says, I have a greater witness than John. Yes, John was a magnificent witness. He was faithful. He did exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. He, he declared Jesus the way he was supposed to. He pointed to all the signposts. He was a faithful prophet. And Jesus says of John, he's the greatest of all prophets. He's the greatest of the Old Testament. And yet, Jesus says, my personal witness of myself is greater than John's. Why? For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. He's talking about his fruit. The fruit of his life is the work of his life. It wasn't like he was bringing forth bad fruit. Everything he was doing was incredible. It was powerful. And I want you to think about this. Have you ever read through the Gospels with the miracles of Jesus in mind to see what kind of, of authority and power he uses? And then think about the Old Testament and all the miracles that the Father did from creation to the deliverance of Noah, from the deliverance of Abraham, to the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, all the way through the scriptures, the deliverances, the miracles that God displayed and did. I'll tell you right now, Jesus matches all those miracles with his own miracles. And they're right from his own authority. It's absolutely incredible. All the way down to when he says there at Lazarus's tomb, he prays out loud and he says, Lord, I'm praying right now, not for, for myself, but for for these around me, <laughs> that they may believe that you have given the Son of Man this kind of power. And then he just simply says, Lazarus, come forth. And that guy comes hopping out in his grave clothes after four days of being dead. I mean, that, that's creepy, freaky power. That would just sober us all right up right there. I think, I'm quitting every sin in my life. I'm done. I've just met the Son of God. You can imagine how intimidating it was for his poor brothers growing up with him. It's like, man, have mercy. And they got to that place where they cried out to the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. And it's awesome. Two of his brothers wrote books of the Bible, James and Jude. Isn't that amazing? Half brothers. And they, they lived with him. They grew up with him. They knew him longer than any of the others. Not now. They're all kind of tied, you know. After you've been with someone for 2,000 years, you don't argue over the three years, five years you had longer with them. <laughs> let's go to the next verse John 10 Jesus says this again if I do not do the works of my father do not believe me but if I do though you do not believe me believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in, my, uh, in him and so here's the, just the reality of it it's not hard rocket science is Jesus good or is he bad? Look at his life. Look at the testimony of his life. Look at what he did. Look at what he said. Is that good stuff or bad stuff? If the fruit is good, the tree is good. That's why we love the cross. This world hates the cross. Why? Because it speaks of their own condemnation. They're going to hell. And the cross is a reminder of it. And they hate it. It's the aroma of death, Paul says. But for us who are being saved, there's good fruit. My salvation, there's good fruit. My changed life, there's good fruit. I'm in love with Jesus. And being in love with Jesus is so incredible and it's so freeing. And it's so full of life and so full of goodness. It's just like, okay, the cross is good. And I now praise God for the cross. I don't curse the cross. 
I'm not ashamed of the cross. To be ashamed of the cross would be to be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul writes boldly, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He has saved us all through the cross. And so if you want to talk about trees and you want to talk about fruit, look at that tree that he hung on. It's the tree of life. It's the tree of life. And it has delivered us from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because that's the only tree we knew before that tree. And hallelujah and praise God for it. So you judge Jesus' life and you determine good fruit, good tree. Bad fruit, bad tree. Don't be calling a good tree with bad fruit. Don't be saying that. That's, that's a contradiction. A tree is known by its fruit. Matthew 12, verse 34. Let's go to our next part, a verse. Brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? <laughs> Jesus says, you're not a bad tree. You're a brood of vipers. I mean, <laughs> this, this is pretty intense. This isn't the first time these guys were called brood of vipers. John, the Baptist, in the wilderness, when they came out to hear John, it's what he says to them. As the Pharisees are showing up, he looks at them and says, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> they're, they're probably like looking over their shoulder, pretending like he's talking about somebody else. You know? <laughs> yeah, a brood of vipers. <laughs> a brood of vipers or offspring of vipers. Vipers were uh, a, a family of snakes, poisonous snakes in the region. They all had some things in common. They all used their mouths to kill. And that's what Jesus is comparing them and their mouths to. David writes, their throats are like an open tomb, the wicked that speak. And that's what these guys were. They were evil in their words. They were devious in the way they carried themselves. There was also a deceptiveness to vipers. You don't see the viper hauling across the desert, chasing after a rodent. No, no, no. They curl up under a bush and they fake rock. I'm just a hide a key over here. And they don't move until that moment. When that prey comes walking unexpectedly by, what do they use? Their mouth. Wham! And they strike with the venom and drop them. And Jesus says, you guys are vipers. Wow. That's sobering, isn't it? Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets, Jesus says. False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. The same tactic. To <clears throat> come with religion and religious garb and religious language and use terms that you're familiar with, but change the meaning and change the emphasis and take you off course from a gracious, loving Heavenly Father and a beautiful walk in love with Him to a life of works and bondage, trying to impress or improve this relationship through your own pride and your own works. And it's, it just ruins the relationship. It's no longer based in love. It's based in your own pride. The Lord hates it. And so he warns about wolves in sheep's clothing, and that's what he's calling them here as vipers. Same idea. Matthew 23, 15, Woe to you, scribes and fairies, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Think of it. These are the guys who just called Jesus a servant of Satan. He does what he does by the power of Satan. Jesus is saying, in reality, you are servants of Satan. And everyone you take down, you kill. You promise life, and then you give them the poison of your false religion. 
And in their self-righteous works, they fail just like you fail. And they fall just like you fall. And they become twice the son of hell that you are. How direct is this? This is absolutely direct. He is warning them, warning them over and over again of their false religion and their false stance before him. Look at Jeremiah 17. And this is where we begin to open up and apply to all people here. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And this is a lead in here too to our next verse in verse 35. But Romans 3, 9 and 10. What then? Are we better than they? Like even as we're sitting here talking about the scribes and Pharisees, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's not our righteousness that we're saved by. And so we can't stand and point the finger and say, we've lived righteously, we're better than you. Verse 12 of Romans 3 goes on to say, they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And sums it up on verse 23 of Romans 3. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what we're learning here today is that even our words matter. Our words matter. And, and when we say stupid stuff, vain stuff, selfish stuff, when we run at the mouth just because we need to vent or just because we want to be funny or be liked, if we, whatever it is, when we just start to run at the mouth with our own words, in a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. And so beware and watch out for this. Now, as we continue on here, look at uh, verse uh, 34, the second part. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is a fact. The Lord is giving us a fact. If you want to know the condition of someone's heart, listen to their words. Their own words will reveal their heart. That's why being a good listener is so important because you can learn about somebody and where they're truly at by their own words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. So here we're looking at this idea that the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what comes out of the heart is the substance of the treasure. Now, when this word treasure, it just means storehouse. It's, it's talking about what's held. The heart holds content. What's that content? Well, it's what comes out of the mouth. That's the content. Is it good? Is it jewels? Is it precious stones? Or is it filthy, rotten, putrid, evil? You know by what's coming out of the mouth. I think of that old cartoon when I was growing up, Saturday morning. They call me yuck mouth because I don't brush. <laughs> Maybe that'll bring some of you back. This plaque guy dancing around on the teeth singing that song. <laughs> I like this quote from John MacArthur. A person's heart is the treasury of his thoughts, ambitions, desires, loves, attitudes, and loyalties. It is the reservoir from which the mouth draws its expressions. And I thought it was so well put. As I read through, I just read a myriad of scriptures on the heart. And that's what it describes, all of these different ideas. The heart was not just emotions for the Jew. It defined the whole person, who you really were on the inside, everything 
what you devoted your life to, what you would consider your motivation or your God, what brought you joy and what made you sad. All of it, the whole parameter of feelings and emotions and the whole parameter of focus, diligence, and sacrifice that you give for your life. Because everybody does both. Everybody sacrifices. You have no choice. God left you without choice. In this regard, you will sacrifice because he's only given you a limited amount of time and you will sacrifice that time to something and someone. Is it for God or is it for yourself or is it for someone else? That speaks about your devotion. He's given you a limited amount of words to say in that time. He's given you a limited amount of energy He's given you a limited amount of resources. None of us have inexhaustible resources and energy. And so what we do with the little that we have is all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And the mouth exposes it. And I really appreciate this fact because even in our own Christian life, we struggle with this, don't we? I will start running at the mouth and I'll notice what I what is coming out of my mouth is death and poison. It's curses and not blessings. It's evil and not righteous. And I'll be like, I need to shut up. I just need to go to bed. I just, I need to not say anything anymore today. I am not doing good today. I just need to go to bed. The only problem with that is I'm in the middle of my work day and I can't go home. <laughs> So I'm like, this is just a train wreck. You know, if you all knew what was good for you, you'd just say, yeah, go home. But no, get to hang out with you all day. Oh, joy. I'll tell you, and I find too, uh, maybe you can relate to this. I'll start today pretty good. If, if I'm, you know, hopping on a good foot here and I jump into the word of God and I start my day right, I'm laying down my burdens and I'm giving it all to the Lord. I just notice as the day goes and I kind of pick up the troubles of the day. By the end of the day, oh, I need more of Jesus. If I try to end my day without him, it's ugly. I don't have good things to say. I'm tired. I'm laying there in bed. And you know, your, it's your poor spouse that gets that joyous moment. <laughs> you okay? No, I'm not okay. <laughs> Let me tell you all the ways I'm not okay. And you're like, how about we just go to sleep? <laughs> that would be wisdom right there. How do we change a heart? Right here. John 15, let's look at it together. John chapter 15. Verse 4. I love this. These are just some of my favorite scriptures. So sweet. Jesus speaking to his disciples. Very intimate. This is, this is uh, last week of his life. He's, he's actually here at this point in the last night. These are some of the last words Jesus said to his disciples. It's worth tuning in, isn't it? This is what he says. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So talking about fruit, this is the subject we're on, bearing fruit. And you know a tree by its fruit. How can you bear good fruit? By abiding in the vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my word, my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. If you have the words of Christ abiding in you, what does that mean? That means that the treasure in your heart is Christ. He already defined that for us. The the passage we're studying helps define this section of scripture. And this section of scripture helps us understand the one we're looking at. 
If you abide in Christ and you are filled with his word, then what will come out of your mouth is his word. And when you pray according to his will, he will do it. He will do it. If I'm filled with my own selfish desires, goals, and plans, if I am preoccupied with me, my prayers are going to be very self-focused, aren't they? Lord, please give me that Maserati. I need it to bring glory to your name and my name too. Because when they look inside that Maserati, they're going to see me. And Lord, I need to protect it. So I need a very big house with a very big garage and an iron fence around with some great security and security guards. And your list goes on and on. Lord, why aren't you doing this for me? Don't you love me? Don't you want to bless me? And Jesus says, look, you're so far off. James says you don't have what you've asked for because you've asked amiss that you might spend it on yourself. But when we're praying in the will of God, when we're praying for the kingdom of God, when we're looking to expand the kingdom of God, I guarantee you God will come through. I guarantee you, when you're under that intense persecution and God wants to glorify himself and show himself strong on your behalf, look out. It's going to be incredible. You have an unexpendable life as long as God is over your life. And it's his time for you. You can't change the end of your life. You're not going to hasten it, and you're not going to chase it away following him. You're only guaranteed it. You're guaranteed it, because it's in his hands. And he can deliver you from anything, any power, any persecution, and any attack. And so you just rest in his love. If I'm to live to be 52 and a little bit, which is today, great. If I'm to live to be 90, I say, please, God, help me. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I want to go home. I'm just, I'm serious. Oh, man, that sounds brutal. You, that, when you start out living everybody you knew when you were born, it's like, hmm, I don't want to be the last one standing. Let's get out of here. Let's go to heaven. And so abiding in Christ, let him fill your heart and your life. Look at this about the, the apostles. I love this. Uh, this verse here. It's so telling. As the apostles stood boldly before the Sanhedrin just after the, Jesus was crucified. This is here at the, um, near the day of Pentecost. It's just after the Pentecost and the persecution has already begun. But, well, they crucified Jesus. You think they're going to quit at, at a few apostles? Are you kidding? They're going to try to stomp them out. So they're standing, the apostles are standing before the Sanhedrin, these re religious leaders who have the power to kill them uh, in human eyes. I mean, you're standing before a, a people that successfully killed Jesus. Their, their track record's pretty good. Um, but the uh, apostles know the power of the resurrection, and they're not intimidated by it, and they're speaking boldly. And it says, now when they saw, this is the Sanhedrin, the governing body of Israel saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were in amazement. Like without education, they're talking bold and powerful and true to the word of God and to the things of God and to what they witnessed and testified concerning Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. They're testifying with boldness. But then it says they realized that they had been with Jesus. And that's exactly what we just read in John 15. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch abides in the, abides in the vine, the branch will bear much fruit. And this fruit is flowing out of their lives. And they're preaching the gospel to the most wicked body of men on the planet who have crucified the Lord Jesus himself. You can't do a more egregious act in all humanity. And they're preaching without fear and total boldness and precision, the gospel. And they just took note. Well, these are guys who've been with Jesus. There's, some, there's your fruit right there. There's, the, there's the, the source. We are not the source of good fruit. We're conduit. You plug into Christ. You let the word of God, word of Christ dwell in you richly. Oh, so good. Well, let's uh, get back to our text and look at our last two verses here. But I say to you, Jesus says, 
Verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus is really, really bringing a strong warning to these guys who are using their words so willy-nilly. They manipulate with their words. They change the story and the narrative with their words. If it doesn't suit them, if it doesn't fit them, they just think of a new way to say it. They're liars. These were the liars and Pharisees of the day. That's what a scribe was, as a lawyer. And just a word wizard. Oh, no, 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 that phrase doesn't really mean that. You, you, you know, you got to look at it from this angle and, and massage the text until it means what you want it to mean. And the Lord is warning, guys, you're going to be judged for every futile, empty, fruitless, idle. That's what the word means. Every silly, stupid word you've spoken. Wow. I'm in trouble. I heard a statistic. I, I don't know if it's true. I've never even attempted to count that women need to speak 30,000 words a day. <laughs> we have a confirmation in the crowd. Can I get an amen, brother? <laughs> that men are just right behind with 25,000. And I think I'm like one of those that helps the average up. Because I think I'm probably 40, 45,000 words a day. My wife can attest to this. She's just like, Josh, you just don't stop talking. It's a good thing you're a pastor. And with that, a multitude of words, there lacketh not sin. I need grace. I need Jesus. And you need to pray for me. I tell you, because I've heard, I, you know, I think the, the craziest things I've ever heard sometimes have come out of the of pastor's mouth. I've been in the church my whole life. I've heard a lot of pastors preach, and I've been one of them that said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And uh, so, yeah, you got to pray for your pastors. We need you to pray for us because uh, we have a very solemn responsibility to bring and deliver accurately the word of God. So God, help us. I'm not the chef. I'm the waiter. And you got to pray that I don't trip on my way out the, the kitchen and to your table because that happens. <laughs> and so here we have a warning. I say to you that every idle word, every empty word, men may speak. They will give account of it in the day of judgment. Wow, there's a day of reckoning. There's a day of judgment where these things that have been said will, will be judged. I mean, can you picture not having Christ's forgiveness and grace, standing before God and being raked of the coals for everything you've ever said? That freaks me out, just the thought of it. You know, when I hear the things that come out of people's mouths, they'll take what is most sacred and holy, like Jesus' name, and they'll mix it with the most horrific, graphic, horrible language on the planet. And they'll mix it together as if it was like a salad. And you're like, oh, you're going to stand before the king one day. And you're going to be looking right at the one you've blasphemed over and over and over and over and over again with your filthy mouth. And you're going to give an account for that filthy language. And the last words you will hear is, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And you will be cast out into outer darkness with nothing left but your hopeless thoughts. Well, to accompany that, a lot of pain, anguish, and, un and discomfort. I mean, it's just absolutely the worst thing possible that could ever happen to a human being. It's why God has placed it in our hearts to yearn for souls and to share his love with others. It's that serious. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. There's fruit again. And oh, that, those words matter. You can speak death into someone's life 
or you can speak life. You can go and tell someone about someone else in a good light, bringing life to that person, or you can kill them with your words and your gossip. And you can tear them down and mutilate their character. Words matter. They matter. I've seen it in my own life, even with my children and bringing them up when they're in hard stages and they're going through tough stuff and they're just wrapped up in their own sinful self. You know, I just get frustrated as a dad. And, I just, ah! and you know, my precious wife would be, speak life over them. Don't speak death. Don't, and I'm like, but they're living in death. <laughs> and I'm trying to get them out with a crowbar. <laughs> You know, you just got to surrender the king, pray, pray through it, and speak life into him. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us with this. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, the psalmist writes. Keep watch over the door of my lips. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> There's the door of your lips. Oh, man, God help us. There's life there. It matters. It matters. How are we saved? Through our words, if you confess, right? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. James has a ton to say about these words thing. And, and what a fire can be started with your mouth. The, the tongue is untamable. It will always say what's in the heart. So be careful, Proverbs says. Be careful with your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. <laughs> where, where is your heart? It, it will be exposed. And your mouth cannot control it. Cannot hide it. It will be exposed. And you will be judged by your own words. And so start with surrendering to the king each day, giving those words to the Lord, for it is those words that save you and save others. Your testimony will save others as well. Let's close out with Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I thought this was so good and just really sums up our Christian walk and, and living for him. Paul exhorting the church says this, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. What should love look like when you put it on? It looks like this. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also, which also you were called in one body and be thankful. So uh, the love of God being worn will be will show forth thankfulness thankfulness and unity you've been called in one body unity in the church is by the love of god thankfulness in the church is by the love of god verse 16 let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom exactly what we just read in abiding in christ and my words abide in you let God's word abide in you. Let his wisdom, his love. Then with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. How? In psalms, in song, in hymns, in spiritual songs. It's why we're a singing people. Why? Because we're a grateful people. Because we're a saved people. We're a loved people. And these are the things which give us the hope and the security to sing to the Lord. Well, I see it in the kids, in kids' worship. I love doing kids' worship, by the way. It's one of my favorite things. Sometimes my days are measured by how that went. Because <laughs> I want to be distracted from how this went. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, I'll tell you, it's so sweet to sing with those kids. And sometimes you can just see the love pouring out of their lives and their hearts. And sometimes you can really see they are a microcosm of the family and what's going on in the family, and you see the weight of the world on their shoulders and that heaviness. Pour 
Jesus into your kids. You have to make a conscious decision. They are constantly being trained on the television, on their phones, on uh, any media, in their schools. They are constantly being trained in the neighborhood, around f other family members. They are being trained the death of this world. The cynicalness, the, 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 the critical spirit, the, the harsh words and harsh attitudes. They are all around and they are constant and those little sponges are picking it up. You can change that narrative by pouring into the life of Christ, by living Christ for them and, and, and to them and, and pouring into them Christ. You should be obsessed with Jesus in the home. Your mouth should be pouring out Jesus and his word. And if it's not, you're in sin. And I'm not here to pick on you or condemn you. I'm here to exhort you. You examine your own heart by listening to your own words and then adjust. And that is when you got to go, okay, I need to go to bed and I need to start the day in the word of God. And I need the middle of the day. I need the word of God. At the end of the day, I need the word of God. I need three squares a day and meditate on it in between and just be thinking about God and being in God's word, or you will have nothing good to say. Wow, this is really sobering stuff, isn't it? Woo! <laughs> we all get to go home with this message, including me, so don't feel like you're getting picked on. I have to listen to the same message three times <laughs> and study it all week. <laughs> Just trying to get your pity. <laughs> Verse 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Hallelujah. There it is. You made it. You survived. There's a conclusion. It is good that the heart be established in grace. Okay, so those were some really serious exhortive words. Ha, ha, ha for us today about our words. But what changes us? What was the answer? Jesus. Who is Jesus but grace? He's the embodiment of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's love, his goodness, his mercy flowing into your life. It is good for the heart to be established in grace, Hebrews says. And this is exactly what we need. The conclusion is, we need forgiveness. We need to be washed. We need to be cleansed. We need to be focused on that forgiveness. And in humility, receiving that grace and love into our own lives, we can give it to those we love, those who matter in our life. And the number of those who matter in your life will grow as you grow in Jesus. That's the truth. And so speak grace into your own life through the word of God and then speak grace into other people's lives and you will watch your words change and their words change and the environment change in your workplace the environment change in your life it is incredible and Jesus has it all and he's bringing it forth right here for us today Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, Lord, for encouraging us, Lord. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And if we're going to be condemned by our words, well, I praise you that we can be saved by our words. That at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, the enemy will tremble and flee. And we can rest our hope in you and fill our lives with you and fill our hearts with you so that out of our hearts flows beautiful words of compassion and love for others. We don't want the fruit of anger, malice, vengeance, hatred, lust, greed. We don't want the fruit of lies, deception. This is all horrible fruit. Blasphemies, it goes on and on. We want the fruit of righteousness, of peace, of love. We want you, Jesus, to be the fruit of our lives. 
We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.